the technology was not fully in place. Did you, <laughs> did you hear my introduction? Uh, thank you. I also wish to emphasize that we are in a field of science where Denmark lags behind a number of countries at comparable scientific level. The topic is mobilization of research resources for the future technological development and focus on academic industrial interaction topic which I've been inter interested in for a large number of years. Let us take a look at the Danish research landscape. Research is very often debated in the country. It also often results in deadlock as a result of polarization between the concepts, basic pure research and applied research. A vast majority of research projects do, however, cover ob objectives between these extremes. But basic aspect we have to consider. We have limited resources and capacity in this country, so we have to prioritize. We have a legitimate expectation that the society benefits from research investment. And this, I think, becomes more and more pertinent in the future. The research landscape will primarily, in my view, be determined by research projects initiated by creative and far-sighted scientists capable of establishing interdisciplinary research groups and centers. And also, we have to admit, research programs outlined politically, but structured in the academic and industrial scientific environments. Here, we have a major challenge to scientific academic leaders. I'll come back to this critical issue in a moment. Let's have a look at projects and programs, and not least with the concept research freedom. Research freedom and level of scientific independence are parameters to be handled professionally at university. Again, a major challenge to academic leaders. If we take the scientific training, PhD have been trained under supervision, and after one to two years postdoc period, the development, the development of junior scientists is normally completed. The acquired scientific skills now allow junior scientists to carry out independent but integrated research within frames of research programs. Some scientists possess or develop a capacity for novel and cross-frontier research coupled with the courage, courage to initiate integrated programs. This requires courage. These scientists deserve full research freedom and resources sufficient to accept established research groups or centers. This means that full research freedom is not a condition automatically available to scientists, but rather a trusted position which particularly skilled and dynamic scientists deserve. Let's take the relationship between research, innovation, and inventions. <coughs> Danish research generally has a strong placing in international research landscape. That has been documented over and over again. And these aspects are prerequisites for access to the international research frontline and for the development of competitive research strategies. However, this is a necessary, but certainly not sufficient condition for the designation successful nation in the international natural science research community. Thus, in terms of transformation of basic scientific results into innovative industrial inventions, Denmark lags behind. That has been documented over and over again. In order to broaden the scope and deepen the focus of this uh, process, profound and continuous educational initiatives should be launched. There must be a continued and increased function, uh, focus on uh, education. Let's take a look, brief look at the educational initiative. We have to critically, over and over again, analyze the student syllabus, perhaps with primary focus on the first year program. As it stands now, the first year of study program 
are often dominated by heavy lecture and laboratory courses. And that, for many students, young students, are killers. Teaching programs aimed at stimulating the student's professional identity should be combined with courses describing other areas of natural sciences and the fascinating borderlines between disciplines. This is where the progress will be made in the future. The history and stories about the, about the key invention should be mandatory elements in the university teaching programs. Academia-society interactions. Companies. The primary goal of the industry is to create and produce products of value for the society. This is generally accepted. But in addition, companies increasingly have obligations of a broader scope formulated as corporate social responsibility. Only a few years ago, this was considered by many companies as a tiresome additional burden. Today, this is now incorporated in the strategic thinking of all companies. If we look at the science world, the, the primary goal of scientists is to provide new knowledge and to elucidate new connections in complex phenomena and structures. The society obligations might be described and analogously as scientific social responsibility and could be formulated as a code of practice. I think this latter statement is at an early stage but will be growing, in my view, in the future. We published it. This was the, the, the concept was coined just a few years ago, and we published this uh, last year in the publication mentioned here. And I want to mention here that the Lundbeck Foundation, which is one of the ma major grants of, of uh, research funding, has introduced scientific social responsibility, abbreviated SSR, as an element in its research funding policy. So it is coming, and it will be spreading in the future, I'm sure. If you look at the university industry interplay, a precondition for effective and fruitful university, uh, university non-university interplay is mutual confidence and respect. Simple words, mutual confidence and respect between the parties concerned. It is of fundamental importance if we want to make progress. The quality of research activities at universities is basically, of course, and it should be so, determined by scientist talents, competences, visions, and again, courage to enter novel research areas. Development activities should generally not be carried out at universities. And this applies to all branches of research, though following different models. It also comprises disciplines like humanities and all the other branches, but the patterns, of course, have to be different. Let's take an example. A university scientist makes an important discovery. It does happen from time to time. The potential use value is discussed confidentially with an industrial or another non-university partner. An estimated use value is secured through patenting and formulation of a contract. Subsequently, the discovery is published as soon as possible, taking both parties' interest into consideration. The further development should be placed in the hands of an external partner. There may be exceptions, but that should be the general pattern. And the university scientist continues the investigation of the basic scientific aspects of the project at the university laboratories, but should keep close confidential scientific contact with the external partner. Again, the word confidential, trust, comes up over and over again. Let's take a closer look at academic industrial patenting. This is an area which is growing pretty wild at the moment. Let's try to boil that back to essentials, and I'll try to illustrate this on the next couple of slides. There should be a running dialogue between academia and industry to clarify industry, uh, industry interest and patentability of potential inventions. This requires a current contact at a confidential basis. Con collaboration should be based on mutual trust. Again, one of these simple words 
it is so in incredibly important and unfortunately relatively rare. Very few patents result in marketed product. That has to be realized by both parties. Payment, milestone, down payment, and royalties must be based on realistic timelines and understanding of industry's investment versus academia contribution. Again, we have to be realistic. In, if academia has a standard collaboration, and some have, and more should perhaps have it, a standard collaboration agreement, it should be open for negotiation in order to fit the specific collaboration in its best way. Joint invention, both, uh, where both academia and industry uh, should have rights, are common in PhD projects already. Again, a few words on, on uh, patenting. In collaboration, should start as early as possible, preferably before the first filing, or at least within the priority year. The limits of the invention should be very clear, for example, in chemistry. Which compounds are outside and which compounds are inside the uh, patenting. Clear mutual understanding of what the claims cover. In clear agreement with regard to publication, including talks and posters. In case of material transfer between the parties, MTAs should be always signed. In a clear agreement on the prosecution of patent, it is in industry prefers to take care of this with relevant assistance of inventors. In clear agreement on payment, with regard to expenses in relation to prosecution, filing, translation, and very often also lit uh, litigation. Clarity, clarity and mutual trust and confidence. I want to say a few words about GTS Institute, which is an important asset in Danish universities. GTS means Goodkin Technologic Service Advanced Technological Group. There is one goal, accelerate innovation in Danish companies through applied research. There are nine not-for-profit such institutes covering different markets and technologies. 20,000 company customers every year, defining the research priorities. I would focus a little bit on Bioneer. This is the GTS Institute I know best. This is within biomedicine and medical technology. It is owned entirely by DTU, the university partnering as a key strategy. Access to new competences and know-how in order to offer new services to Danish companies. Access to specialized facilities equipment for basis of new services and joint development of com commercialization in new intellectual properties and commercial maturation of university inventions. I think that in the future, triangle collaboration patterns rather than bilateral agreements between universities and companies would be very helpful. And I've illustrated here in a simple fashion how such a, a triangle collaboration structure could be established. We have the university with basic research, we have the GTS with applied research, and then industry value, uh, industry value creation. And this triangle would be able to mobilize public investments in science. And again, I think triangles would normally be more operational and more facilitated by bilateral structures. Now, if we look at the uh, complementary uh, competencies, uh, I have illustrated that's also using the triangle structure, that's to emphasize it. Universities, strong in basic research, relatively weak in applied research, and, weak, and very weak in development. It is the opposite to GTS Institute. Strong in development, relatively weak in basic research, although much basic research are carried out at the GTS Institute. And finally, again, the, just to illustrate the, the uh, interaction, the complementary uh, competencies uh, on the basis of creating synergy through alliances, universities, the DTS Institute in the middle, and we have the companies to the right. So this interaction would seem to be very creative and very facilitated. Just a few words about leadership. Again, simple word. Typical dinner conversation topic 
easy to talk about, difficult to establish. But we have to state that a prerequisite for success of the new universal law is not terribly new anymore, but it was introduced a few years ago, is the accessibility of competent academic and research leadership. Academic rector, dean, head of department, research group, center, and program leaders. Leadership experience from industry is only to a limited extent useful in the academic world. Of course, there are overlap between these two leadership challenges, but the overlap is limited. General precondition for effective and sustainable leadership is documentation of scientific competences at the international level. This is a prerequisite for the sort of the power to be a leader in the, in the academic world. Leaders must have a capacity to make decisions in academic environments generally characterized by high levels of self-centeredness and competition. It's already focused on these aspects of vital importance for the academic scientific environments, but the area needs strong attention. And many resources from the over dimensioned and to a large and immaterial university bureaucratic machinery should be re redirected, for example, towards the leadership initiatives. I think also in the patenting area, the bureaucratic systems is overwhelming and could be reduced dramatically if we take a simpler, straightforward uh, view. Again, on leadership competences, uh, uh, the head of department, center leaders. Again, capacity to formulate superior scientific goals. Ability to formulate visionary ideas, to create enthusiasm. Create enthusiasm. This is a real driving force in any scientific environment. Within the frames of research group or centers, which should be sufficiently broad and flexible to be attractive for different groups of scientists. Frames for science should be brought so that even odd scientific competencies should be incorporated so that they can interact with other types of, uh, of scientists. Awareness of the pronounced dynamics of scientific structures with respect to immediate goals, technologies, and participating scientists. Stimulation of collaborative efforts to reach the research goals and at the same time allowing each scientist to achieve a desired level of individual scientific performance and development. Is this a paradoxical statement? It is not. It is really possible both to try to reach the own personal priorities and also to work with other scientists in an integrated manner. The final slide is a, a, a term that I coined a few years ago, scientific drowning, a challenge to scientific leaders. There is an exponentially growing amount of scientific information and data, and that would immediately seem to be positive for, this, uh, for the scientific process. It also is with some limitation. Nevertheless, in spite of this, for example, the research-intensive pharma industry is experiencing a declining flow of novel drugs in recent years. This is paradoxical. To some extent, this paradoxical development may reflect that scientists are drowned in the hectic flow of information, and similar mechanisms also play roles in the academic world. A critical step in building up research products is the transition from the analytical phase and to the experimental approach. And there, scientific drowning is a uh, an, an issue of very critical importance. Here, research leaders have a, a very important role to play in assisting a junior scientist at this risky step, taking into account that decisions always have to be taken on an incompletely analyzed basis. But here, scientific leaders are, would be of incredibly uh, great importance. Finally, I have had many discussions with my colleagues Fleming Biesenbacher, now chairman of the Carlsberg Foundation, Paul Anderson, CEO at Bioneer AS, Klaus Böse, senior vice president at Hohe Lundbeck AS. Thank you very much indeed. Um, please uh, remain at, at the 
uh, where you are uh, right yeah. now, because there may be some comments or questions. You have a very nice way of presenting fairly pro provocative statements in a very nice sort of smooth way. It's, it's actually much more uh, mind-stirring what you've said than I anticipated, and I anticipated a good deal. Um, anyway, um, who would be the first to either challenge or congratulate Paul on his talk? <coughs> yes, please. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I agree completely with, with your notion that trust building is essential to have any sort of uh, way forward in, in terms of innovation. What do we need to, to, ena to enable that trust building to take place? It, it's not magic. Uh, it requires work. How do we make that work? In the, the, the mechanisms in, in trust building, this is what you are asking for. I'm not sure we need additional structures. I think we need additional training of young scientists so they get these basic uh, elements into their scientific training. But the, the importance is the simple things, the, to have trust, to be honest, to have a clear expression of your preferences and also in relation to, to the people you are collaborating with. So you don't need anything else in terms of structures. Maybe you need fewer structures, but you need training of the young scientists and then at the same time uh, competent and far-sighted scientific leaders. So this has, that may require a structure to somehow structure academic leadership. This remains to be demonstrated, but these two aspects are of key importance in my view. Anybody else? Yes, please. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, the uh, interaction between industry and academia, and most of your presentation focuses on the, what we could call the ability of university and researchers to push their knowledge uh, into the uh, industry. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the pull side, the pull capacity in the industry? Um, you mentioned that uh, there should be a scientific social responsibility, but do you have uh, good concrete recommendations for the industry to follow? <coughs> well, I think the, the social responsibility is a built-in uh, concept in the industry through the corporate uh, 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 social respons responsibility. So I think the, the challenge the challenge is lying on the, in the in university side. We are not used to think in terms of the social responsibility. Of course, it is a push-pull system. You have to, the universities have to offer something. The industries also have something to offer and to be open to the, to the uh, university people. And uh, of course, openness and the expression of your clear views and again to live up to the simple concept of confidence and to maintain the agreements that you have been establishing. It is not, I am talking about on base of experience. I've been working with this for more than 40 years, in, in the, especially in the academic world. And uh, I think, the, I think the, the basic elements perhaps are there, but they have to come to full bloom, again, with full appreciation of you have a push-pull system between universities and uh, companies. Please. Mike Nelson with Georgetown University. I particularly liked your slide on scientific drowning because that's what I do every day. <laughs> I work on internet studies and everything's changing so fast. I just can't keep track of all the different developments in my field. And part of the problem, I think, is the, the reward system that we have for researchers. Universities don't reward researchers for writing one quality article a year. They will reward them for writing 10 mediocre articles. So I'm curious if you have any suggestions on how we can change the reward structure, how we can in, uh, incent people to provide higher quality work that everybody should read rather than just churning out paper after paper that no one has time to read. <coughs> I, I fully agree with you. I fully appreciate your, your comment and your question, and you are very right. I think the process is ongoing. 
I think there's an increasing focus on, on the quality papers and some sort of neglection of the sort of say fill up, fill up uh, papers. But also in, can come back to the term scientific drowning. Today, if a young scientist is moving into a new area, you sit in front of your computer, you press a few buttons, you put in a few keywords into your computer, and you get 50, 100, 200 references flowing out of the computer. I'm afraid if you are not guided in this process, you will be drowned and your enthusiasm at the beginning will be killed. And you should also keep in mind, when you get these 100, 200 references, as we see that floating out of that computer, I estimate, based on my personal experience, between 15, 25 percent of these references are more or less incorrect. Some of them are wrong. So what is the, how do we handle this? Well, I, am, I did my basic research in the middle age. Went to the library, digged into the books, and took inspiration from what I was reading. It is not so easy to do today because it, the, the amount of data is so overwhelming. But I think the, the, uh, the academic leader and mentor who has pushed his own ego, ego back and is willing openly to discuss with a young scientist, they can help each other to come through this and allow the intuition and the competencies to be decisive factors in the decision of your, of your project. A young scientist would normally be helpless in this situation. I can't get further to your, your question, but I, I, I think the drowning process can be killing. Well, if I might put myself in uh, as a comment and a, a questionnaire right now, I think what you uh, described right now is actually in a nutshell what leadership is. Leadership is not administration, it's like using this intuition and helping younger people. Yeah. Um, if, if more people in industry and certainly also in the university world would uh, have a m more proper understanding what leadership is, it, that would help an awful lot. So, so I, I thought actually you gave a very good answer there. What, what I'm more concerned about is uh, your stressing of trust. Um, whenever you get into trust, it's such a nice concept, who could be against trust? Um, there is a, a wonderful uh, Paul Newman movie where he plays a character of a senator, uh, I'm sure a, f a fictitious uh, senator in the United States, about 60 years old. And uh, that man in his, um, well, about 60 years old is very interested in young ladies for reasons that I cannot understand, of course. Uh, anyway, um, he usually tells these young ladies that they should show trust. And what happens uh, sort of indicates very clearly that that's what they should not have done. And to some extent, uh, that story repeats itself in the scientific community, where not the bureaucracy of the universities, but the bureaucracies of these huge organization, uh, industrial organizations can completely overwhelm particularly young researchers. And they'll come in with a standard contract and say, well, show, you must show us trust. We are this well-known company and you know, we have existed for so many years and our shareholders like us, us an awful lot and this, that, and the other, so sign there. And younger researchers might be able to show trust and like these young ladies uh, find afterwards that they are in a condition that they might not want to be in. Uh, I don't know if you have a, a comment on that. <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> I must say I, I fully agree with your comment. And of course, the trust, if you, there's a tendency also in science, maybe particularly in science, I don't know, to play roles. Try to play roles in order to cover where your real intentions are. Roles will be disclosed sooner or later. But if young scientists are faced with this, and the person which they are dependent on, it can be critically uh, uh, devastating. So I think there should be part of the interaction between the, main, the mentor and the young scientist right. that you must be able to look through the role players and through the surfaces and see where are the real, where are the real uh, substance in this, particular, uh, in this particular person, in this particular situation. There's no easy way. There are also sociopaths uh, everywhere. 
maybe not least in, in science. And it is very, very difficult to identify these people. And you, you have not identified them, perhaps, before you, you have your, one of your feet in the lock. So it's a, it's a major challenge, but without responsible scientific leaders, competent leaders, you are very often lost. So thank you for your comment, well, Lars. Well, thank you. And you say, essentially, that the answer is the leadership yeah. from more senior people. More comments, questions? Yes, please. You mentioned the apparent paradox that we do very well in our scientific positioning uh, in, in the world, generally through our scientific achievements, but then you also indicated at least that we are not sufficiently good at transforming that knowledge into innovations. And in one of your slides, you had uh, a list of steps that could be taken. I think you started out by saying a scientist gets an Important, uh, makes an important discovery, and then you outline the steps. But where do we actually see the bottleneck is? What is it we should do to become better at transforming all the good science into technological advancements? <clears throat> I don't think there is a golden, there is a golden thing to do in this regard. There are many things that should be done. And uh, I, I think the, the problem, as I see it, we don't have a real, we do have it now, perhaps beginning, a real a research debate, but the polarization between the fundamental views in science and the applied science. This is a killer of the fruitful uh, debates. How, how, do we, how do we improve it? I think it is a question of attitude, again a special of, uh, question of uh, training of young scientists at, during the educational process, that they should be aware of the sort of the fantastic uh, events that have been Except with the inventions, the, the fa basic inventions. The people can see that if they, if they really want, without disturbing their own career possibilities, they, if they can get it fueled into the society, it has, uh, this will be not only good for them, but it will be very, uh, very rewarding. So I think much of this is in the educational process. But again, it's, there's no easy, very clear cut the steps you can make from day one. I think we had a last question, comment. It is in a way a, a question, uh, but it's more a comment. Uh, if we look at the process of converting knowledge into, let's say, product, it is uh, my experience by trying that for really many years, it is uh, definitely not a linear process. It is a uh, it is a more a stochastic process. It is not a process you can uh, sit down and create, and if you are doing so and so, then you will end up with uh, being a millionaire. That's not the case. But uh, a, a, a situation from my daily real life is that we have uh, been dealing with scanning probe microscope for nearly 25 years. And uh, one month ago, we signed a contract with a small German company called uh, Carl Zeiss, and yeah. where we integrate the SPM technology into the electron microscope and other charged particle microscope in order to increase the power of this sort of microscopes. And I, I talk with this uh, uh, management there when we negotiate the detail of the contract that we are the mouse and they are the elephant, and they respect that point of view but they told us that they need the mouse. And it's, it tells all in one that the world is not linear. <laughs> and uh, you will in a few, uh, uh, in within one month, you will see s some of the first product in this combination are getting on market. That's just a comment, but it's uh, still also an example of a non-linear process. If I may comment very briefly on this. Of course, the, the line from an, an, a discovery to an invention is not a straight line. It normally runs wild and you will get nothing out of it. I think in order to, in order to be successful, is to, you, ha you have to allow for your intuition to work and you have to, if you have a signal, just a very small signal from one of your experiments, for example, you must have the courage to follow it. It, again, 
if you, if you believe in straight lines, you are lost. It is serendipity is of importance and also intuition and, um, and uh, courage. My diffuse come, come to, your, to your comment. Uh, should we, you seem very eager. So uh, eagerness should, of course, prevail. I think that um, you are stepwise coming from a scientific idea to a product uh, which you have described may be particularly valid in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry where there is a common understanding of both the basic and the um, applied research between the different parts in the group. Now, when it comes to other fields of um, uh, sci technical scientific science, uh, it may be quite different. Let us take an example. Uh, at a university institute, a new principle has been developed which might lead to an instrument, to a machine, or to maybe a consumer product. Now, the range of industries in this country which could convert this basic idea to a product is limited. And you will mostly find that if this is a completely new scientific principle that has been uh, developed at the uh, university level, you will not be able to sell this as such to a more industrialized, um, uh, to, an, to an industry, or maybe not even to a, a, a um, um, applied research institution as the GTS institutions. We'll have to develop that further. And uh, my experience um, from 20 years as a GTS institute leader says that in order to make a product, product available for commercial production, you may have to go as far as to produce at least a prototype of the instrument to prove that this principle can function and has, first of all, a production and secondly, f a, a commercial value. Uh, which is far beyond the, the, the limit level between, uni in your you mentioned that research should only be done, at the, the basic research be do done at the university level in all development on more industrialized stages. In many cases of scientific work, you will have to go much further with development at the first step in order to get it be done. Thank you. Well, <coughs> even understand. though this, uh, this talk was not in the program, I think it was very welcome. <laughs> uh, it, it might have been let put in the program, but anyway. Let, let me say, well, I, uh, I understand your, your comment, but still, and you have experience with the GTS Institute, but I still, in this process, from the, from the discovery to the invention, the GTS Institute will, after all, be very useful. And my own experience, I, I admit this is the pharmaceutical biomedicine area, the, this uh, institute, GTS, has been tremendously important and is, it will be of growing importance. The problem with the GS Institute is that they are locked in a, a severe bureaucratic system which is limiting their activities. And I hope we will hear more about this later today where we'll hear more specific about the uh, GTS Institute. But I think the GTS Institute forming these triangle structures could in many cases be very helpful. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.